There'll always be money in politics. What has radically changed in the last decade plus is the guardrails about how money is used in politics are completely gone. We don't elect our members of Congress to go fundraise. We elect them to go govern. So let's remove the burden. It's a big country and people are very busy. How do we get their attention without spending money? I'm Julie Rose, and this is Top of Mind. I have been a radio journalist for two decades, but a few years ago, I found myself avoiding the news for long stretches because of how depressing and divisive it all seems. I still wanted to be informed and engaged on important issues, though, and I figured I couldn't be alone in that. So we created this podcast. Each episode, we tackle one tough topic in a way that will challenge you, help you feel more empathy, and empower you to become a better citizen, a kinder neighbor, and a more effective advocate. Today, America's political money problem. My very first election at the time was the most expensive race in congressional history. It was 2014, and David Jolly was running as a Republican in a special election to fill the seat of a longtime Florida congressman who had recently died. It was an evenly split district then, and the National Republican Party was very concerned about hanging on to the seat, so Jolly's political debut was a barn burner. Our little race in uh, one county in the state of Florida just blew up for about 90 days, and I believe it was $14 million was spent in about 10 weeks, and I raised $1.4 million of that which tells you the amount of outside money that was controlled by either the national parties or special interest groups in that one little house race. Jolly was stunned. He had worked for his predecessor in Congress for years as a staffer, but he'd never seen the inner workings of the political campaign money machine. Right away, he was told to hire a finance director. I naively thought, great, I need a staffer to go raise money. That's not how it works. The staffer is a babysitter who puts phone numbers in front of the candidates, says, call Jim, tell him he, you know he gave $10,000 last year to Republicans, you're in a competitive race, his daughter's name is Sally, she just graduated from University of Florida, tell him a joke about the Florida Gators and then ask him to max out to you. Max out, meaning give him the maximum that one person can legally donate to a candidate's campaign. At the time, the max was $2,300. You go through the list, you dial for dollars, and then you go to the next one. You've never met these people, but it's basically telemarketing. It's political telemarketing. Were you good at that? No, I was terrible at it. <laughs> I was awful at it because it's so disingenuous and inauthentic. So for me to raise $1.4 million took four months. His opponent raised a bit more than that. But there was another $10 million of outside money that drowned out the candidate. And those outside groups had a huge fundraising advantage because there's no legal limit on how much they can raise from a single donor. And there's no limit on how much they can spend or what they can spend it on, so long as they don't coordinate directly with any of the candidates in the election. So on the right, maybe it's a gun lobby, a pro-life lobby, a chamber of commerce lobby, an anti-regulation lobby, whatever it might be. And on the left, it's the, the unions and the reproductive freedom groups and the environmental groups and so forth. They can come in and spend a million dollars as long as they don't tell you what they're doing. The NRA, for instance. I d ultimately don't support the NRA's agenda and condemn them along the way, but they came in and made me out to be a Second Amendment champion as best as they could. So they were running television ads that were like, David Jolly is a friend to the gun movement. To support and me, <laughs> that I disagreed with. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, ultimately, I guess it, it helped you win, yeah. right? So. Uh, yeah, I mean, so this is where those seats become commodities to the interest groups and the candidates we were just, you know, pawns on the chessboard, and it's, it's only gotten worse in the last 10 years. It's almost quaint to think that $14 million was a record amount of money in a U.S. house race, but that was a decade ago. The most expensive house races these days see double that spending. Presidential elections are twice as expensive as they were back then, too. And the amount of outside money pouring into elections has escalated as well. Outside in terms of special interest groups that can spend as much as they want, but also outside in terms of geography. Two-thirds of the money congressional candidates now raise comes from big donors who live outside of their own districts. 
and often even their own states. Americans are not happy about this. Overwhelming majorities of Republicans and Democrats tell Pew Research that the cost of campaigns makes it hard for good people to run for office and that big donors and special interest groups have too much influence over politicians. Plus, people who give money to political campaigns, whether small or large donors, are more ideological than the average citizen. That's according to many studies on this subject. And special interest groups, by their very nature, have a narrower focus than the average voter because they exist to back a specific view on an issue like guns or taxes, all of which makes political campaigns more politically polarized and polarizing. So today on Top of Mind, the reality of money in American elections and what we might do about it. While elections in the US only happen once a year or so, depending on the office, political fundraising never stops. So here's an eyes wide open moment. Once David Jolly won that bank-breaking special election in Florida, he went to Washington thinking his dialing for dollars days were done for a bit. He was wrong. The majority leader of the House at the time, Republicans controlled, he was a prolific fundraiser himself. I am now facing re-election in about five months. He says, I want to meet with you to talk to you about fundraising. And I think, fantastic, the majority leader of the House is interested in my fundraising. So we meet across the street at the political committee because you're not allowed to do any of this in in your official office. And we go behind closed doors and I'm thrilled he's about to like unlock the keys to the kingdom or whatever he's about to do. So this majority leader says, okay, sit down. He goes on the whiteboard. He said, today's, you know, May, June. You have five months until your election. He says, five months. And he and he says, times 30, you have 150 days until your election. He said, you need $3 million. And he does a elementary math equation and tells me, your job is to raise $120,000 a day or 40,000, whatever the number was. I, I don't remember exactly what it was. And he circles it and he looks at me, he's like, you got it? Then he turns to my, my chief of staff or deputy chief of staff and he says, now look, your job's the hardest of all because you have this newly elected member who wants to prove to his district that he's going to be a good member. But his first job every day is to check off that fundraising number or he won't get reelected. And that's going to be your job, Mr. Deputy Chief of Staff, is to keep him on track. I was angry. What was it that you were angry about? I I think it crushes the spirit of public service. I I remember the night I got elected. You go through this vicious campaign. You're, you're, You're going after your opponent, they're going after you. You got nothing left on election night bitterly divided community that for three months had been part of this. I win with 49%, my opponent 47, and a libertarian with a few points. And I remember standing up that night and saying, I realized tonight that more people voted for someone else than voted for me. So I have 49%. I said, my job now is to prove to you that I'm worthy of your vote the next time I stand here. So when I was confronted with the reality, time and time again, not just that one meeting, but it's, it's banged over your head in weekly and monthly meetings with the party. Your job, your first job is to raise money. I, I just wasn't going to do it. And as a citizen, it made me angry. He soon learned he was not alone in his frustration. There is a, a genuine anxiety and lament among members of Congress called call time. It's on every members of Congress schedule. You can see them drudge, dredge across the streets to the Republican or Democratic headquarters and work the phones. And when the parties meet, you know, every, it's not every meeting, but usually once a month, there's kind of this like telemarketing atmosphere where members present checks and they ring the bell and, you know, I raised a half million and I've got a million for the party. At At the Republican headquarters for years, I I presume it's probably still there, there was actually like a scoreboard with every member's name and how much money they raised and how much they were giving to the party. And you either felt the pride or the shame based on where you were. So yes, among members, rank and file members, we talked about it all the time. And Jolly says the pressure to keep up with the escalating cost of elections influence the rest of his schedule in Congress too. You have 10 times more meeting requests than you're able to take. But your staffers, your finance director, your chief of staff says, you really need to take this meeting. Now, in a prudent environment, they may not tell you why, and I, I never really knew exact amounts, but some members absolutely do. I mean, some members will tell you they expect a check to coincide with a meeting request. Does that mean that an elected official or member acts on the request? Maybe. 
maybe not, but what we know is it has ensured access. And so in some really uh, particular cases where maybe you're a member without an agricultural interest in your district, but the ag you know, community needs a national vote on something, they will shop around for members to be supportive and educate those members on their side of the issue. And that member may never hear the other side. It, it just might not happen. That, that is certainly an area where I think you start to realize there is a corrupt influence of money in politics. David Jolly ended up winning re-election easily that fall. No one challenged him. About a year later, he took what he considered a small step toward addressing the fundraising problem with a measure called the STOP Act. That simply said, once elected, a member of Congress may not direct, directly solicit a contribution. Your campaign staff can, your finance director can, you can attend fundraisers, but it is it was taking a member of Congress away from the job they were elected to do. The Democratic Orientation book in 2010 maybe said that members should spend, I believe, 20 hours a week raising money and 10 hours a week in committees. We don't elect our members of Congress to go fundraise. We elect them to go govern. And if if they are spending more time fundraising than governing, it's a violation of their, of kind of the public trust of what we've asked them to do. So it starts with that idea that as a workplace burden, we are disrupting the role of governing by demanding this of members. But the STOP Act did not pass. We only had eight or nine members sign up for my proposal, but we probably had 20 or 30 say, I'd love to join you and I hope you're successful. <laughs> they just couldn't. They couldn't go there because, again, leadership crushes you, the National Party crushes you, and the reality of the resources you need really starts to weigh on you. You were already unpopular with Republican leadership at that point. Is that fair to say? <laughs> <laughs> the STOP Act really did. So I broke with, I called on Donald Trump to drop out of the race in December of 15 uh, over the Muslim ban. And then when I made this move and I agreed to talk to 60 Minutes about it, I, I was persona non grata, but that was fine. I, I didn't get into the politics to make friends and stay there forever. After completing the end of his predecessor's term in Congress and one term of his own, David Jolly lost re-election. And in 2018, he left the Republican Party to register as an independent. He's now a practicing attorney, a contributor to MSNBC, and an advocate for campaign finance reform that goes way beyond what he proposed in Congress. I would support anything that, that allows restrict, greater restrictions and ultimately the pursuit of getting money out of politics. Chipping away at the rules is not enough. It doesn't work. It has to be radically undone. David Jolly is a former Republican congressman from Florida's 13th district. Now, he wasn't the first or last member of Congress to try and limit the influence of money in federal elections. One of the most recent to take a swing is Republican Senator Josh Hawley of Missouri, who introduced the Ending Corporate Influence on Elections Act in late 2023. He's hoping to ban public companies from spending money in elections. And I commend Senator Hawley for doing that. The problem is that when Congress tries, they go to the Supreme Court and it gets struck down. This is Jeff Clements, constitutional lawyer and CEO of a nonprofit called American Promise that's taking one of the more dramatic approaches to the political money problem. A constitutional amendment that would empower Americans, empower the states, empower Congress to pass reasonable and effective rules about how money is used in the political system. And, you know, money is always a part of politics, always has been. What has radically changed in the last decade plus is the guardrails about how money is used in politics are completely gone. How did the guardrails come off? What happened was a constitutional rewrite by the lawyers and judges. So, first of all, there is a long history of restricting money in American politics. Back in the early 1900s, Congress banned corporate spending in federal elections to prevent big companies and Wall Street banks from bribing elected officials. When labor unions got powerful, they too were banned from contributing directly to campaigns. Along the way, progressive reformers began to worry about the power political parties held, so Congress passed limits on how they could raise money. And after the Watergate scandal, Congress added a bunch of new fundraising rules and created the Federal Election Commission to enforce them. But 
Several prominent politicians, including Senator James L. Buckley of New York, sued. And their lawyers made a novel argument. That spending money is free speech. So the first time the Supreme Court had ever considered that idea was in the late 70s in a case called Buckley versus Vallejo, challenging those federal, new federal laws after Watergate. And once the Supreme Court declared that spending money for political purposes was a form of free speech protected by the Constitution, the justices effectively made themselves the chief regulators of campaign finance in America, says Clements. They suddenly started getting inundated with all these cases where lawyers were saying, "Okay, this one, this law should get challenged, too. So by the early 2010s, culminating with the famous Citizens United ruling, The Supreme Court had settled on a basic logic for when it's okay to restrict political spending. See, anytime the government inhibits a person's constitutional right to free speech, it has to have a really, really good reason. So when it comes to the free speech of political spending, that compelling reason is bribery. Like if you give a politician money um, and say, I'm giving you this money so that you will pass a law that will make me rich, basically. You cut my taxes, say, here's the money to do that. And the politician says, okay, I'll do that. That's still illegal. We're, we're allowed to limit that. So donations made directly to a political candidate can and are limited. Right now, the max that a single donor can give a candidate in a federal election is $3,300. And the Supreme Court also says it's okay to limit how much political parties and political action committees, also known as PACs, can raise from any one donor because they often pass that money through to candidates. So the risk of bribery is still there. But if a person or group raises and spends money to influence an election without talking to candidates or coordinating with their campaigns, the Supreme Court says... No, nothing, no regulation that limits quote, so-called independent spending will be allowed to stand. And that's why it's changed so much in the last decade. So that cluster of court rulings that included Citizens United in 2010 gave rise to the super PAC, says Clements. In Latin, super means above. So super PACs are effectively above campaign finance law because they don't coordinate with candidate campaigns. And now, as long as it doesn't coordinate, unlimited money can go into those super PACs. But what the court, I think, got wrong was the assumption that all these other ways of spending unlimited money was not also corrupting. The super PACs do everything the campaigns used to do. They run the ads, they are doing door to door, they're doing signs, they're doing volunteers. And so even though they can't coordinate technically, you see the candidates going to the super PAC donors all the time. Mm. So they're courting, they might court, a candidate might court a $100 million donor, knowing full well that the candidate's campaign can't take a $100 million contribution, but nothing to stop that donor from being like, all right, I like you, I'm going to go find a super PAC that backs you and give my money over there. Yeah, or they'll just create a super PAC that day. Mm. And and, oh, yeah. they'll, and, they, and they'll be very clear that the, that super PAC is created to support a particular candidate. And Congress can't do anything to restrict them. Neither can states. Because the Supreme Court says political spending is protected by the Constitution itself. Now, one fix here would be to give the Supreme Court a chance to change its position. And that has happened before on lots of issues, including school segregation and abortion. But so far, that approach has not worked. Which is why Jeff Clemens thinks we need a constitutional amendment. It's called the For Our Freedom Amendment that we're proposing. It's on our website, AmericanPromise.net. And... It would go back to what most Americans think it should be and what it was, which is that the states and Congress and the people fundamentally have the authority and the power to enact reasonable and effective um, rules about how money is spent in elections. And that states can pass limits that the Supreme Court won't be able to overturn? Correct. As long as they're fair and even-handed. What a state couldn't do, what Congress can't do under this amendment is pick and choose, like who gets to be heard and who doesn't. You know, as long as it applies to everybody equally, yes. What types of laws could you see, would you expect to see states passing if this constitutional amendment were in place? I think there is a huge consensus on a number of things um, that right now we're told we're not allowed to do that Americans will do very quickly. Foreign governments spending money in our elections, I think we'll, we'll have laws that will stop that. 
Um, right now. So technically, like the Chinese government can't like fund, but they could go through like a Chinese owned corporation that has headquarters in the US or whatever. It's not just like President Xi is donating to a candidate. President Xi isn't donating to a candidate. No, that's still illegal. But the Communist Party of China could very easily decide to run money into an election in the U.S. through all the same vehicles that other so-called dark money comes through, and you you would not be able to trace it. And we think this is happening. No, there's no question it's happening. So dark money is political spending that is untraceable. Typically, groups that fundraise for political activities have to report their donors. And the Supreme Court figured that transparency would keep outside spending accountable to the public. But so many loopholes have sprung up. The public is in the dark on lots of the money pouring into our elections. So it's coming in that way. But the other way that you mentioned, through corporations, it's absolutely happening. In Maine, um, there was an issue about a, a, a international energy corridor being pushed through the state's forest lands um, to bring power from Quebec down to Massachusetts. Um, Hydro-Quebec is 100% owned by the government of Quebec. So it's a government operation. They spent millions and millions of dollars in Maine's elections. And they were, the CEO of Hydro-Quebec was asked, could you do this in Canada? And they said, oh, no, no, our, our elections are serious business for the citizens. We, we're not allowed to spend money. And that, yet they're doing it in our elections. So you saw it in Montana, an Australian um, company did that. So there's there's a lot of rural, um, rules, I think, that we would get quite quickly that Americans just are unified. We, we can't have that. We got to shut that down. Um, like, and foreign money is one of them. I think th we had a broad consensus, and I believe still do, on corporate and union money, that it, it shouldn't just be the Wild West. I think um, limits on PACs, you know, so that you wouldn't have the super PAC problem, that you, they could be high limits, but there'd be some kind of rule about these, these super PACs. Um, other states might say, look, we don't want our school committee elections nationalized, you know, a bunch of super PACs from a city far away trying to tell us what our kids should be learning in our schools and electing a, a school committee. And they'll have rules about outside money like that. So a, a constitutional amendment requires Congress to pass it, right? And then states have to ratify it. It's been a long time since we've pulled that off. <laughs> and is it, even, is it even realistic in such a polarizing moment that we're in in America today? Let me say a few things about that, because it's a really important question. We don't do constitutional amendments every day. Um, but what's interesting is we do them about every 50 years. And when we do them, we usually do two or three or four amendments. So we did four constitutional amendments between 1961 and 1971, about 50 years ago. About 50 years before that, we did four constitutional amendments between 1910 and 1920. About 50 years before that, we did three constitutional amendments to put the country back together after the Civil War. So I, I think what happens is we as Americans, um, af after, you know, a few decades when the system doesn't function like it, it, it should have, that some of the reasons are constitutional and that we have the ability to try to fix it with amendments. So more precisely to answer your question, Julie, it takes a two thirds vote in Congress to propose the amendment. That's 290 votes in the House. We already have 200 votes in the House. We have about 50 in the Senate. We need 67. And then it needs to be ratified in 38 state legislatures. We have 22 states that have formally passed resolutions telling Congress, pass this amendment, get it back to us, we're ready to ratify it. 22 states. So this seemed really hard 10 years ago. Now, I think it is quickly moving to a tipping point where it's inevitable. To read the full text of the For Our Freedom Amendment and see if your state and members of Congress are on board with it, go to AmericanPromise.net. Jeff Clements is the group's CEO. So one strategy is to try and take control of campaign finance law away from the Supreme Court. But that's if the goal is to limit how much money is flowing into elections. Suppose instead we did the opposite. We could raise the fundraising limits on other political players 
to give them a better chance of competing with the unlimited ability of super PACs. To my mind, the organizations that should be managing most of this money are the political parties. But why would we want to let the two major parties have even more power over elections? Well, let's find out. I'm Julie Rose. This is Top of Mind. Americans may differ on precisely how to address the issue of money in U.S. elections, but there is a bit of common ground we can agree on, which is that there's way too much of it, right? I wouldn't say we have an exorbitant amount. It's a big country and people are very busy. How do we get their attention without spending money? This is Ray LaRaja. I'm a professor of political science at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst, Massachusetts. So we actually don't have an, an exorbitant amount of money in politics? Yeah, I wouldn't say we have an exorbitant amount. So um, I often point out that per capita spending in the United States is, you know, not out of line with per capita spending in some other countries. Really? Yeah, I mean, in terms of the size of our economy as well, uh, we, we have a very large GDP. And usually we, you consu- economists will tell you you consume goods based on the size of your economy. Well, we have a huge economy, so we consume a lot of campaign advertisements as well. People need a, uh, to pay attention. It's very hard to get their attention in this country. So what worries LaRaja is not the total price tag of U.S. elections. It's how much of the money flows in favor of the rich and politically powerful. Is it going to the campaigns that really need it? Or is it going to people already have a lot of money and they're using it to just kind of accumulate their power in Congress or in the state legislatures? And I'm, I'm concerned that most of the money, in fact, the vast majority of it, does come from wealthy people and wealthy organizations. And those donors often are in the same zip codes around the United States, places like New York City, uh, Los Angeles, Dallas, Campaign financing has become very nationalized now. If you're in a close race, you're going to see a lot of independent spending, more than you can raise on your own in all likelihood. Because the stakes for controlling Congress are so high, and there's so few races that are competitive, that all these groups, all these super PACs, pile into this general election to make sure their side wins. And so they're having a disproportionate influence on the outcome of these elections. And who are they? They tend to be, again, from a different socioeconomic class. Um, And not just that, they also tend to not represent all the interests in American society. So what would be better? Well, here's where LaRaja goes against the grain. If somebody's going to spend a lot of money, the ideal situation, to my mind, is a group that represents a lot of Americans. And they're accountable to those Americans. Maybe they have elections for the people who lead that group. And hopefully they get money from a lot of different people. And that group will engage in elections to represent the interests of that broad group of citizens. Now, there is a, an organization like that out there, although some people might not like, like them, but political parties, their raison d'etre is to represent a lot of people. Now, we only have two major parties. Other countries have more, so some people want more choices. But to my mind, the organizations that should be managing most of this money are the political parties because their goal is to win elections. And if you want to win elections, you have to mobilize and represent as many people as you can. So, says LaRaja, let's boost the limit on how much political parties can raise. As of 2024, an individual donor can give a maximum of $123,000 to a national political party committee. So that would be cutting a check to the DNC or RNC or to one of the political action committees the parties have to raise money for U.S. House and Senate races. LaRaja says, let's triple that donation limit. Maybe to $300,000, $400,000 each. That seems like a lot, but I think uh, compared to what Billionaires are giving to super PACs. That's not very much. He thinks states should raise their limits on political party fundraising, too. But I can guess what you're thinking here, because I was thinking it, too. A third of Americans feel like neither major party represents our interests well. We'd like different options. So why would we want to make it easier for the two dominant parties to flex their power and push our politics further to the extremes? Yeah, that's a good intuition. It really is. Um, So here's how I'd respond to that. First, say you're somebody who wants more parties. 
you can't really start a party without having a lot of money. So if you really want the Green Party to take off or some other party uh, that's somewhere different, um, they need resources. And right now it's very hard for the parties to get enough resources to build an organization in 50 states and be sustainable and recruit candidates. To really get a project going, it often requires a patron, someone with a lot of money who starts it off. And then they catch fire and more people want to support it. And it's hard for a patron to put down that investment because there's severe limits on how much they can give to a political party. So you're saying making it easier to raise more money would be good for any political party, including it could provide the kind of resources that a minor party might need to get off the ground. Exactly, exactly. Okay. If you're but it would be party, a real boon for the Republicans and the Democrats, would it not? It would, it would be. A, it would be better for both the Democrats and Republicans. And that, that, um, my response to that, this gets to your polarization question. Because the feeling is here, wow, we have these parties that are so far apart already. By giving the monies, aren't we going to just make them more polarized? Well, um, that's not necessarily so because going back to what I said earlier, a political party wants to win elections. And the way you win an election is you put forward a candidate that's going to appeal to the broadest set of people. Okay, so a party has some incentives to give to more moderate candidates. But what happens now in U.S. elections is special interest groups are the kingmakers because they've got the deepest pockets. And they have narrower interests compared to the general public. Those interest groups are very polarized. So they're the ones who are saying, they, they give litmus tests to the candidates when they run in primaries. And they say, unless you pass this litmus test, you're not going to get our support. And if you don't get our support, we're going to run people against you. And they do it for members of Congress who are, who are in office. We're going to run primary candidates against you if you don't tow our, tow our line. Contrast that with a political party. They are very focused on winning more than ideology. Of course, many of them have principles and things like that, but th they want to control government. And so they want to focus as much, if not more, on picking the candidate who might be more moderate because that candidate will do better in a purple state. So my point is if the parties could play a stronger role in the primary, in helping to push a candidate they think is probably more representative of the district. And if they had enough money in the general to really fully support that candidate, they become the 800 pound gorilla in that race that uh, could temper polarization. But I'm not gonna solve it. It's, our polarization is not just about money, but this is something that adds to it and creates this kind of cycle because uh, the same people who are ideological are supporting ideological candidates and keeping them in office. But could we really count on the parties to back less polarizing candidates if they had more money? All around the country, we see state party organizations doing the opposite, putting forward candidates with more extreme positions than the typical voter. LaRaja says that's a money problem, too. What is going on today is most of the people who get involved in party politics are very ideologically extreme. They're purists uh, at the local level, and they don't want compromise. And what I'm, and this is another reason why. So there's two things that need to happen, and all these things are complicated. Number one, if the parties were more well funded, you're going to attract more talent, professional talent, to the party organization. Right now, we have this freewheeling world of consultants. Why? Because they get paid directly by the candidates. If the parties had money to give out, consultants would want to work directly for the parties more frequently. And they would be fighting with the purists within the party to say, no, we can't do that. Because political consultants have an even stronger incentive to appeal to the broadest swath of voters since they literally get paid to win elections. The other thing I would say is... Um, we have to get more people involved in local politics who aren't just purists, who, aren't, who don't just care about um, symbolic issues, who really want to see change in their communities, and they want to do it through the political parties. So I would really encourage people, if they're thinking about doing something civic, I mean, parties are civic organizations, and I, I would like to see more people involved at the local level. And what are the things you do? You talk to voters. You recruit people people who you think are good to run for office. 
You put up lawn signs. You do things that are fun with other people. It's a social system. So uh, that, I think, would go a long way towards making the kind of party insiders more representative of voters themselves. Hmm. What would prevent well-funded parties from using that money to solidify their uh, their edge over the other other party through gerrymandering and eliminate any chance of these more purple districts where you might have more of a 50-50 split and we might actually see even more moderation <laughs> than otherwise? Yeah, good point. So... There's another set of reforms people should consider, and one of them that seems to be working is independent commissions. You're not going to get all partisanship out of even independent commissions, but they would have certain principles they'd have to follow, and uh, the order of the day would to be to try to create districts that are more balanced. Uh, you know, I, I'm not putting all my faith in political parties and their, in, their incentives to win. I'm, remember, I'm saying they're going to moderate because of their incentives to win, but their incentives to win also do exactly what you're suggesting, is that try to manipulate the rules of the game so they win all the time. So you don't want the actors who are playing in, in, in campaigns to be able to manipulate the rules. You want that to be stable, and you need an organization that makes sure that people pay attention to the rules. On the fundraising side, the Federal Election Commission is responsible for enforcing the rules, but partisanship has stymied its effectiveness for the last decade. When it comes to the common practice of politicians drawing district boundaries to benefit their own parties, LaRaja thinks states should establish independent commissions to do that work instead. There are several states that are doing that now, mm -hmm. and the trend is in that direction. So I think that's, that's pretty positive. But surely, to repeat your point, you don't want them manipulating districts to their advantage. You're not going to get that entirely out of the system, but any way you can mitigate that, you're, you're promoting a healthy election system and a healthy party system. If somebody was going to characterize me, they'd call me a realist. This is the game. These are the cards that have been handed to us. How do we make the best possible outcome? And to my mind, it's empowering the parties. And to LaRaja, empowering political parties is a more realistic lift than passing a constitutional amendment or trying to get the Supreme Court to change its mind. The biggest barrier is, frankly, the way you and I feel about political parties. Well, that's, a, that's the issue. Public opinion is dead set against most of these ideas. Now, I will say, I would combine this with, <laughs> here's another idea the public doesn't like, but I think it's a good idea. I mean, political scientists, you have to understand, we have a lot of ideas that we think would work pretty well, but no one likes them. <laughs> so, but we're going to put them out there anyway. <laughs> so, so for those who want more engagement by voters, you know, small donors have been very active lately. Um, and some, some candidates have powered their campaigns from small donors. Although I must say that small donors are just as extreme ideologically as large donors, which is a problem. But if you want to encourage more um, representative small donations, you can use public funds by, if you're running in your local Utah district, anybody who gives to you in your district $20, the, uh, the, the government would match it with a subsidy by 10. And that would encourage you to go out and talk to all your constituents and raise money from them. Because right now, you're more incentivized to call people in California and Texas and New York to raise your money because it's just easier to do that. And those people are not representative of your constituents. Professor LaRaja, thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Julie. Ray LaRaja is a political science professor at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst. And he's co-author of a book called Campaign Finance and Political Polarization, When Purists Prevail. Let's drill down on that last suggestion he made, because it's another of the big ideas out there to deal with the influence of money in our elections. It's called public financing. And there's already a program for presidential candidates to get public funding for campaign expenses, but they have to agree to fundraising and spending limits to get the money. And in this era of huge outside spending in elections, no major presidential candidate has opted for public financing. On the local level, at least 14 states and 25 local governments across the country do a version of what LaRaja was suggesting, where candidates can get a grant or matching donations from public coffers. There too, the requirements to participate mean many of the most well-known candidates opt out. But the city of Seattle has seen the opposite. 
We've had great candidate participation from the very beginning. It's a program called Democracy Vouchers, and advocates think it could work on a much bigger scale. That's next. I'm Julie Rose. This is Top of Mind. A few months before every city election in Seattle, registered voters get an envelope in the mail. Oh, would you like to see this year's? Yeah, sure. Okay. Renee LeBeau heads up the Democracy Voucher Program for the city of Seattle. So inside we have an informational mailer. Our residents can return their vouchers in a envelope that's postage paid. And this is what this year's Democracy Vouchers look like. Okay. So it's perforated, it looks like. It is perforated. Each one looks kind of like a check or maybe a coupon you could redeem for $25 worth of something, which immediately made me wonder, is there like street value to that to that piece of paper? Like, could I go out and, you no. know, exchange that for something? No, it can only be used to give uh, donations to can- candidates who are using the program. And so, what, so in order to donate that $25... You write the candidate's name on the top line. You sign your signature and date it and send it back to us. We then check, have the signature checked by our local elections office. And if the signature is good and the candidate has completed the qualifying process, they're eligible to receive public dollars that they've collected. Back in 2015, Seattle residents voted to raise their property taxes by an average of about $8 a year to become the first in the country with democracy vouchers. The tax generates about $3 million a year and expires in 2025 when voters will have to decide if they want to continue the program. Seattle voters typically get $100 in democracy vouchers to spend in every election. Anybody running for mayor, city attorney, or city council in Seattle can apply to collect them, says LeBeau. So the first thing they'll do is they'll sign a pledge that they are going to abide by the rules of the program. And some of those rules include um, accepting a smaller contribution limit. They agree to at least three public debates, and they also must complete a qualifying process. So that includes collecting a certain number of small dollar cash donations as well as signatures from Seattle residents. Why why require candidates to jump through hoops like that in order to receive democracy vouchers? Well, it's, it's public money, and we want those dollars to go to people who are serious about running for office and representing our residents. In the last citywide election, candidates collected $2.5 million in democracy vouchers. LeBeau says virtually all candidates who can participate in the program opt in. And in competitive races, they routinely max out what they're allowed to collect in democracy vouchers. But there's an escape clause. If there's suddenly a bunch of outside spending from these independent committees that's against them or for their opponent, they can request to be released from the limit so they can go collect private money beyond that cap. So we don't want to hamstring candidates for something that we don't have any control over, which is, which is the independent spending. Um, A few cycles ago, we had a very interesting experience. Towards the end of the campaigning period, there was a lot of independent spending. Big money was being spent for and against candidates. And we would routinely receive calls from residents asking about, how come my candidate is in this limit, but yet these companies and outside money can just spend you know, like a million dollars. How is that fair? I only have a hundred dollars to spend. So it kind of ruffled some feathers and created, I would say, a window into this, how money does impact politics and how it can happen at the, at the very last minute. But I just remind them, you know, you're the one that's going to get the ballot in the mail. They're not. So you still get to go vote. And the vote is really what matters. She also gets calls from other cities curious about whether democracy vouchers might work for them. I just tell them, if you can get a funding source, I think you should go for it. I think the potential for this program to encourage people to stay involved, to invite more people into this political process of money and politics, I think is very important. I think the more we can put the people back in, it just dilutes the power of that money. And I think that's the best we can hope for. It is working almost better than I had allowed myself to hope. Alan Durning worked on the initial campaign to get democracy vouchers passed in 2015. He heads a nonpartisan think tank called Sightline Institute. 
And he had spent the previous decade trying to get Congress to pass a national climate policy. But our observation was, was just gridlock and the system just seemed unworkable. And so that's when we started focusing attention, not just on the issues that uh, initially brought us to the table, but on the, the rules of the game for the whole process. What, what has been different because democracy vouchers are in place in Seattle? We have, first of, you know, first of all, all these systems have to be voluntary. That is, can, candidates have to opt in. And almost every candidate opts in in every election cycle. So it's working for candidates. It's working for voters. We're having huge increases in participation in, in giving to campaigns compared to the past. Um, six or eight-fold as, uh, increase in the number of people who are supporting campaigns. Um, we've had almost a doubling of the number of candidates who are running and a much greater diversity of candidates who are running, younger people, more women, more people of color participating, a wider ideological array, not just on the left. There were fears from the, from the business community in Seattle that this was gonna be supercharged the left in Seattle. That has not happened at all. It has helped folks all across the political spectrum. It's basically helped people who, can, who have, a, have a compelling case to be made. Another thing that it's done is it has eliminated the gap between the donor class in the city and the voters, like used to be that there was a big difference in the in the demographic profile of who was p paying for campaigns versus who was voting in the campaigns. Now that's it's one and the same. We've got, you know, if you if you do a statistical analysis of who the people are who are using vouchers, they look just like the voters. They're spread all across the city. They're not just from the view homes and expensive neighborhoods. It, the, the, the voucher participation turns out to also lead to other kinds of participation as well. We've seen that once people have committed a voucher, they're more likely to volunteer for campaigns. They're more likely to get their, can their friends to vote, so voter participation has increased. Um, they're also more, more likely to give a cash contribution as well, but the average gift size has come down. So we've got more people giving small gifts and fewer large gifts going. So this is a system that is working all across the board. If one of the motivating um, desires for you was to try to help government be more responsive to the people as opposed to the donor class or special interests. Um, has that happened? Does it feel like Seattle city government is more responsive in how they govern? That's a great question. That's, that's kind of the $60 million question here. Uh, it's really hard to measure how well a government is working. What we can say is that the amount of turnover in city offices has increased. What political scientists call the incumbency advantage has diminished. It, it tends to be that if you're an incumbent in, a, in an office, you can probably just stay there for as long as you want because it's relatively easy for you to raise money. You've already got name familiarity. But in Seattle, thanks to the Democracy Voucher Program, it is much easier for voters to find, to, to learn about um, new interesting challengers. And so we've had more turnover. In that way, I think the system is more responsive to voters' wishes. And we've had uh, we've had sort of two waves of um, of change in the in the in the city council, first a shift more to the left and then a shift back towards the center. Um, in that way, we can point to responsiveness as a result of the democracy voucher system. In terms of, the, in terms of how well the city is governed overall, I don't know what a, a way to measure it. It's been a very hard time for the last decade in, in Seattle, as in many American cities. Rapid economic growth, widening income disparities in the city, huge um, a huge influx of fentanyl and homelessness, and then the pandemic and the Black Lives Matter, George Floyd crises, and uncertainty about how we want to do policing and criminal justice. All these challenges have happened in Seattle as in other places, and it's hard to say what the effect of the democracy voucher system is in our in our management of all those things. So there is. You know, there are people that would like to see this rolled out on a national level. Is there any scenario in which you could see that working? The reason to do democracy vouchers in Seattle, from my perspective, is mostly to demonstrate that it's possible elsewhere. I mean, it, it's helping in Seattle. It's, um, but but uh, the real potential is at the state and at the national level. I absolutely believe that ultimately democracy vouchers are a solution to a whole lot of problems at the federal level. I, uh, history teaches me that... We probably need to win 10 more cities and two or three states before we can 
seriously engage in a campaign for national adoption of democracy vouchers. But now, so Oakland has adopted it. It will be on the ballot relatively soon in Los Angeles. It's been on the ballot in Austin, Texas, and I think Albuquerque, New Mexico, almost but not quite successful. I think we need to win a bunch of cities and then find a state where we can win adoption and then prove that it works in those places. It would need to be a path that is both left and right. Um, if it gets sucked into the partisan vortex and becomes identified as only a Democrat solution, which it's not, uh, but if it were, that would that would be poison for it. Alan Durning, thank you so much for your time today. I really, really appreciate it. It's been a pleasure. Alan Durning is the founder and executive director of the Sightline Institute, a nonprofit think tank in Seattle that focuses on environmental sustainability issues and nonpartisan reforms to make democracy work better. We also heard from Renee LeBeau, who is the Democracy Voucher Program Manager for the Seattle Ethics and Elections Commission. Well, a sticky problem like money in politics was never going to have a simple solution. But let me just summarize the landscape here in case it helps. Imagine we've got a playing field. In one end zone, there's full public financing, where we get all private money out of U.S. elections. So each candidate gets a set amount of public tax dollars to run their campaign. No fundraising, no outside money, no personal money. Down in the other end zone, we've got the idea that we should let the money flow and remove limits on certain groups like political parties so they can better compete with the super PACs to back candidates that represent broader interests. Somewhere out there on the field, in between the end zones, is this idea of using public money to boost the influence of everyday voters like you and me. That might be through governments matching donations or giving every voter some tax dollars in the form of like a democracy voucher to donate to the candidate they prefer. And then we've got the folks on the sideline who are arguing with the ref, which is the Supreme Court in this case, to either change its mind about money in politics or step aside so Congress, state, and local governments can write new rules for the game. Which approach do you prefer? I'd love to hear your thoughts. Email topofmind at byu.edu. Let's have a conversation. Top of Mind is a BYU radio podcast. Today's episode was produced by me and Elena Beck with help from James Hoops, Sam Payne, and Samuel Benson. Our sound design team includes Gabe Vargas and Brandon Lewis. I'm Julie Rose. We'll talk soon.